Conference recording has started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Fenway Institute at Fenway Health. Thank you very much for coming on this beautiful June evening. Uh, the Fenway Institute is the research, education, and training and policy arm of Fenway Community Health Center. Uh, we focus on LGBT health and HIV STI prevention and care at the local, state, national, and global level. I'm Sean Cahill. You guys feel free to come in. Uh, I'm the Director of Health Policy Research here at the Fenway Institute. And I want to thank a few people uh, before we uh, get going. So I want to thank Susan Ryan Volmar, uh, Nan Duma, and Tim Wang, as well as the panelists uh, seated here for helping me conceptualize uh, this event tonight. And I also want to thank my, my colleagues in communications, uh, Chris Viveros, Elizabeth Gruber, Bren Cole, and Phil Finch for helping us to publicize the event along with Susan Ryan Volmar. Um, a little housekeeping, uh, we have restrooms just behind the elevators and um, we have restrooms on every floor so if uh, you know the restroom is um, busy you can try another floor. Um, we have developed questions and we'll have a structured conversation followed by questions from you in the audience. And also we're live streaming this so welcome to those of you watching online. So I'm going to start off by introducing the panelists briefly. Uh, so first, uh, to my immediate left, we have Dr. Jenny Potter. Dr. Potter is Director of LGBT Population Health and Co-Chair of the Fenway Institute. She's Professor of Medicine and an Advisory Dean at Harvard Medical School. Formerly the Director of Women's Health at Fenway Health, Dr. Potter co-edited two seminal textbooks on LGBT health, The Fenway Guide to LGBT Health and Trauma, Resilience, and Health Promotion in LGBT Patients what every healthcare provider should know. Uh, Dr. Potter also co-authored a very important um, monograph with the American Association of Medical Colleges in 2014 titled Implementing Curricular and Institutional Climate Changes to Improve Healthcare for Individuals Who Are LGBT, Gender Nonconforming, or Born with Differences of Sexual Development, a resource for medical educators. Okay. Uh, next we have Gary Bailey, uh, MSW, ACSW. Gary is a professor of practice at Simmons uh, School of Social Work and at the Simmons School of Nursing and Health Sciences. At the School of Social Work, uh, he coordinates the dynamic racism and oppression sequence. In 2010, Professor Bailey was elected president of the International Federation of Social Workers. Um, he was also appointed to the Council of Social Work Education Global Commission. He previously served on the board of the North American and Caribbean Association of Schools of Social Work. He was president of the U.S. National Association of Social Workers from 20, 2003 to 2005, and president of the Mass Chapter of NASW in the 90s. Um, he is on the board of Fenway High School here in the Fenway neighborhood, uh, also on the board of the Mass Education Financing Authority for the last 10 years, and he serves on the boards of GLAAD, AIDS Action, and um, worked with us on a LGBT Youth of Color research project here for many years. So welcome, Gary. Um, and then we have Sue Katz. Uh, Sue's business card identifies her as a wordsmith and rebel. Uh, she has lived and worked on three continents uh, as a martial arts master and currently teaches fitness and dance to seniors and elders. Um, she writes fiction about LGBT elders. Um, her books include Lil Lillian in Love, Lillian's Last Affair, and other, st and other stories, and Thanks But No Thanks, The Voter's Guide to Sarah Palin. Um, Sue was involved with the women's movement uh, in, the, in, the, in the early years of the women's movement and founded the first lesbian collective here in Boston, which was an explicitly working class collective. Uh, and she now does advocacy on LGBT older adult issues. Um, and then, um, to Sue's left, we have Grace Sterling Stowell, who is the founding executive director of the Boston Alliance of GLBT Youth, known as Bagley. Uh, Grace joined this group in 1980 um, and is a steering committee member of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Caucus. Grace was a founding member of the Healthy Boston Coalition for GLBT Youth, the Massachusetts Governor's Commission on Gay and Lesbian Youth in 1993, two and the National Youth Advocacy Coalition in Washington, D.C. And she currently serves as a member of the Massachusetts Commission on LGBTQQ Youth. Um, and Grace is also an amazing historian. 
with an encyclopedic knowledge of local and national and probably international history. So it's great to have you here. And then um, we also have Gary Daffin. Gary has been affiliated with the Multicultural AIDS Coalition since 1999 and serve, has served as its executive director for how long? I think this bio's a little out of date, but like 15 years? 19. He is co-chair of the Massachusetts Gay and Lesbian Political Caucus, the state's oldest LGBT advocacy organization. Uh, and we also have Stuart Landers, who's going to join us um, a little bit late, but I'll wait until he gets here and then I'll introduce him. Um, so the first question that I have um, is, in your view, what has been the role of LGBT health advocacy or one part of that, for example, gay men's sexual health advocacy, in the movement for LGBT equality and liberation, especially in the early years after Stonewall? One of the, one of the important roles that uh, organizations, in, at least in Boston, and I'm sure that they existed all over the country, particularly in major centers, um, were places like Fenway that were providing uh, STD um, testing and treatment. Uh, we forget now that the ways in which we looked at treatment of sexually transmitted diseases in the 70s, 60s, 50s, I wasn't there in the 50s and the 60s, uh, late in the 70s and the 80s, um, it was a public health issue. And so you had public health nurses so that you went to get tested. Uh, the old Fenway uh, living room center on Haviland Street was like a in some ways like a cafe, so you went in, there was not an embarrassment, but you went in and saw people that you knew who were also getting tested. Um, if indeed you had a partner who had uh, been exposed to gonorrhea, syphilis, or any of the others, um, it was not unusual for a public health nurse to contact you um, to tell you that you had been exposed. And so it was a different, a different environment, but had we not had systems responding to what then was an embarrassing situation sometimes, we wouldn't have had the infrastructure in place to begin to do what we needed to do around HIV and AIDS. So out of something that seems now to be uh, important but relatively minor when you compare it to a pandemic, um, was able to evolve uh, Fenway Health, which was so important. Great. Uh, the first question, what has been the role of LGBT health advocacy or one piece of that in the movement for LGBT equality and liberation, especially in the early years. Actually, I'll take this opportunity to introduce Stuart. Um, Stuart Landers uh, just joined us, and he has been a senior consultant at John Snow Incorporated since 1994. Uh, he consults on issues related to HIV, substance use, LGBT health, and a number of other issues. He's worked with a number of federal agencies, including the HIV AIDS Bureau Ryan White Program at um, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, and the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, and Stuart has worked over the, over the decades in both the Boston and Massachusetts Departments of Public Health, right, on HIV and broader health issues, lots of other uh, disease prevention issues. He's associate editor of the American Journal of Public Health and teaches public health at Tufts University. And Stuart was a board member, board chair or president? board chair for Family Health, and an early volunteer. There's a great picture of you in the 70s with a full head of hair in front of um, the Haviland Street uh, facility for Family Health. So it's great to have you on the panel. So anyway, if you want to answer that question or anyone else who has uh, thoughts about this first question. Um, well, so I don't have really thoughts about the 70s because I was in Alabama and George Wallace was my governor. Um, I got here in 81, so I can talk a little bit about the 80s, um, and I think Stuart can talk about this as well. Um, <laughs> I was trying to youth it, give you a little uh, So, you know, one of the, I always, since I worked in LGBT advocacy for most of the 90s and 2000s, and, but I didn't start working in HIV professionally until um, 2000, but I had helped start an HIV organization that's focused on black and Latino um, gay and bisexual men in 1993. So, <clears throat> so what I noticed is that I think that we, um, the two are very closely tied to each other in how they, how they advanced. 
and I don't think we would have advanced the LGBT civil rights movement as quickly um, if we hadn't had um, HIV happen and the, the, the sort of mobilization that happened around that. Um, but at the same time, I think that um, HIV forced people to make a decision about their own humanity, and I think that helped us a lot. Um, and so, and a lot of people died, and the number of people died meant that people from all kinds of families were affected. And so people started to come out, which I think is the single most important thing in the LGBT movement in the past 40 years. So people were coming out, people were um, demanding that their brothers and fathers um, and sisters in some ways, sometimes, some cases, um, be allowed to, to die with dignity at the time or at least be treated decently. Um, and in the legislature, you know, the Civil Rights Bill in Massachusetts, was, which was filed in 1973, we had a majority in the, in the legislature in the House in, 1990, in 19, 1983. Um, but then that was about, about when HIV hit, and so it stalled things. People got really scared, like, okay, are people going to think of gay people as AIDS, and what is AIDS? And, uh, so that, for a moment, um, right around 84, 85, I think Rock Hudson died in 1985, and people started to think about, oh, well, it's not just those people, it's kind of everybody. Um, so we finally got a, a, a majority in the House and the Senate in 1987. Um, and there was a, that was when, you know, all the work that we had done, person by person, getting one more vote, one more vote, telling people you won't lose your, your um, won't lose your job, won't lose your election if you vote with us, hit the point where people were said, you know, to Billy Bulger, you've got to let this come out for a vote. And once it came out for a vote, we won. Um, and that majority, I believe, was part of what helped us over the next 10 years when, ha when, when LGBT marriage, when gay marriage happened, we had built a, a solid enough core of people who had come to know us um, and who had then heard all the stories about people who were dying of HIV. We had one of the biggest HIV AIDS line items in the country at the time, I think. Is that right, Kevin? <laughs> um, back in 2000. Um, and it became that when we lobbied for HIV money, um, we were able to say, this is really what the gay community wants. And because the gay community had built a certain amount of uh, political power, or influence at least. And so the two things really kind of went hand in hand for a while. Um, and I think, I think now we're in a sort of different kind of space in both, both issues. But there was a, I think there was a real synergy between those two. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I apologize for being late. Boston traffic, of course. Um, I, I think there are two, two quick, very quick stories, I'd say, about, about how things were different. Because I do think a lot about how rapidly things changed and evolved and how hard it is for people to really put themselves back in space and time to what it was like. But um, one thing I'll say is, uh, at the time, Gary, uh, at some point, was already ensconced with Arlene at the Mes Lesbian and Gay Political Caucus. And there was an activist in Boston who became a very famous national activist named Eric Rofus. And he had formed a competing organization called the Mass Political Gay and Lesbian Political <laughs> Caucus. <laughs> oh, Alliance. 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 Sorry. And um, there was this big town hall meeting. And you know, the I don't know, I was like an Eric Rupi and I was tagging along, but at the, somehow at the end of the meeting, my charge <coughs> was to organize a group that was going to try and lobby for greater privacy laws to protect men having sex at rest stops. And like that was the notion of gay health at the time. Like let's make it safer for men to have sex in the places where they go to have sex. Very different. I left there thinking, I don't think I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I just won't tell Eric. Anyway. So fast forward, 94, so it's, it's different, but it's not, there are some things that are interesting. I went to JSI, and JSI had a gay and lesbian caucus that was a shining example of a group that did potlucks and had little meetings and sometimes would do a gay pride day for the office. I said, how about we talk about LGBT health issues? It took me like three or four meetings before people like understood what I was talking about. And they're not dumb people, it just, it didn't exist, right, really, um, in that sense. Maybe more in mental health arena, and certainly around STD and sexual health by that point. But, but not really even in the mental health area. Yeah. So. 
It's interesting to think, too, of some of the amazing history that Boston has in the feminist movement back in the 60s, 70s with the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, which really was the beginning of at least locally, but having a very large national and eventually international influence on women's rights in general, and the whole idea that women should have the right to do with their bodies as they wished. And um, I, I was just looking on my bookshelf here at Fenway. I inherited some wonderful books um, from some of my predecessors, and one of the books is called How to Have a Baby Without a Man. Mm -hmm. And I forget what year it was published. It was. Um, well more than 30 years ago. And this is sort of along those lines. It was published by Susan Robinson and a colleague, and it basically was outlining the beginnings of alternative insemination and how lesbians and single women essentially could choose to have families, which fast forwards into our ability over time to have chosen families and to create our own families in, in any way we choose. And if you follow through that thread around bodies and um, owning one's own body and having the right to determine what your body is for you and what parts it will and won't have and all of that. And you can fast forward into the trans health um, arena now and the, the book trans, trans Bodies, Trans Selves actually kind of mirrors the Our Bodies, Ourselves idea that the Boston Women's Health Book Collective initially set out. Yeah. And I would add, you know, I think in any, when any community uh, starts to organize, you know, a starting point has to be that you believe you deserve something better. And, and a, another marker for our community was the removal of homosexuality from the DSM as, as a mental disorder. And so we had to believe that there, that we were, we were good people and we were not we were not mentally ill just based on our sexual orientation or gender identity and expression, and that we in fact deserve quality care. And so the, that, and, and, and others have mentioned, you know, the, the convergence of a, of a whole number of uh, social justice movement from the black civil rights movement to the women's movement, the anti-war movement, and, and so many others really gave a sense for LGBT people as well that that we deserve something better and that we needed to organize because, of course, if we weren't organizing for ourselves, who who would? And so I think certainly we're lucky that in Boston and Massachusetts we, we were in the forefront in many ways of LGBT health and services and programs. So uh, I think that's an important point to bring out just around what, what, gets, what gets things started and as we come together and we do the research and do the community uh, assessments and do the work necessary to build community, then that, infor that, that pushes mainstream organizations <clears throat> and institutions to treat us better at the same time that we're also developing our own services and programs. Can I just add something? Grace just reminded me of something. There's a great program episode on This American Life, uh, and it's called 81 Words. Um, this American Life, 81 Words, and it tells the story, uh, the real story, of how 81 words uh, were removed from the then Diagnostic Statistical Manual in 1973, it was. And uh, it really is quite fascinating of, how, of the process that people had to go through, gay psychiatrists uh, trying to convince their colleagues that they existed because their colleagues did not believe that you could be gay and a psychiatrist, therefore there were not. Mm -hmm. And so that they just had no understanding that they were interacting and that this meeting took place in Hawaii. It's well worth taking a listen to. I'd also add that if we look at the implicit bias um, in my world, which is the world of mental health and looking at the DSM and others, which are racially biased, there's absolutely no question in the ways in which they've been created, who, who does the testing, as part of the test, who does the writing, et cetera, that there's inherent bias. There also was that inherent bias built in that was anti-queer, anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-trans, because we weren't doing our own writing. We weren't part of the panels. So in order to control the narrative, you have to be a part of the process that's going to determine, help determine what the narrative is and also help to put a stick in the sand that says what normality looks like as well. Just in the uh, interest of clarity and accessibility, the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. That's okay. So we'll try to um, spell out acronyms. Um, and uh, okay, so if it's okay, I just want to jump ahead to 
the question four, which is for Sue Katz and others, and sort of following up on a theme that's already emerged, which is how did the LGBT health movement relate to and emerge from feminism and the women's movement, including the women's health movement? And Jenny, you already touched on you know our bodies ourselves and the women's um, uh, book book collective, the, the women's health book collective. But maybe Sue, you could elaborate a bit. Um, I, I'd like to go back uh, even before our bodies ourselves. Uh, to 1968. I mean, there's a million things I could talk about on this subject, and I just decided to pick this one. And in 1968, there was the intersection of three things that happened. Um, uh, one of them was that the women's movement started and it exploded. It started 68, 69 were the years in which the women's movement went just full throttle right across the country and really exploded. I've been in many movements and I'd been in many movements up till then and I have been since and I've never seen anything like the proliferation of, of collectives that happened. The women's movement was as much about gaining control of our bodies as it was about anything and it continues to be exactly that because uh, all forms of fundamentalism have at the root of their ideology, the control of women's bodies and reproduction. And so, uh, you know, the beginning of the women's movement was the beginning of taking back our, our bodies. So that same year, 1968, a woman named Ann Kurt published an article called The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm. Freud had uh, uh, said that the only mature orgasm was the vaginal orgasm, and that vaginal orgasm uh, kind of uh, oppressed us for, for many, many decades because Freud also said that if you didn't have a vaginal orgasm, uh, you were frigid, and frigid was another weapon that was used very, very frequently, and not the least during the mid-60s and late-60s during the sexual revolution of the hippie movement, which was all about women just putting out, putting out, putting out after the 50s, which was all about women closing their knees, closing their knees, closing their knees. None of them having to do with volition. So she wrote, and she brought us the clitoris. This was a great gift, trust me. <laughs> One I have appreciated ever since. And that brings me to the third thing that happened in 1968, which was the company Hitachi. Uh, produced a vibrator, a plug-in vibrator called the Magic Wand, with, with which I must admit I've had the longest intimate relationship of my <laughs> life with the Magic Wand. And those three things, I mean, I lived then in a collective and a commune and with my Women's Liberation Collective, and boy, the buzz, there was always buzzing coming from one door or another door, and it was an incredibly healthy uh, endorphin-filled moment to have those three things come together. So that was the example I thought I would bring. Great. Um, I'd just like to say, I think I've always felt and I still feel that the women's movement and the energy around women's health is probably like the closest sibling or whatever type of familial relation the LGBT health movement has. I think so much about control of one's body and self determination and empowerment were very much and I guess and there was a parallel book for men gay men about sex lives that also somewhat mirrored our bodies ourselves and explaining the parts and what goes where and how you might clean this or do that um, but you know I, these days I find I'd have to kind of look at what the broader arc too and feel that there's so much politicization around health that goes I'm sure it goes back to the beginning if you read the autobiography of cancer, but the, um, like the uh, Margaret Sanger, who's a controversial figure in some ways, but, but the fight for family planning in the 30s, 20s and 30s, um, the family, the community health center movement, which is of course part of Fenway's origins, where it was doctors taking control of the healthcare system, finding space, offering care to people, stealing supplies from their hospitals. And um, so there's this whole web. And of course, the civil rights movement. You can't ignore that right in the middle of the whole thing. Absolutely saying, you know, we're just going to 
demonstrate and show that we can do this. And, and those roots are so critical. Could I, I just add about um, birth control, uh, which in Massachusetts and much of the country was illegal for single women, birth control, illegal for single women until 1972. And that only changed because in 1967, I think, yeah, 1967, a guy named Bill Baird came to Boston University and handed uh, birth control to a 19-year-old woman who took it, and he was arrested, went to jail, took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And I remember this well because I was the 19-year-old girl, wow. and there's a big documentary being made about it, and we just sort of redid it at Boston University uh, a couple weeks ago. So birth control, illegal. Sound familiar? Um, yeah, just quickly. So, I mean, one of the things about being in Alabama, people talk about Stonewall. I never heard of Stonewall until I was an adult. There, were, there was not, there was no one was covering it. There was no paper down there that would tell you anything about what was happening in the gay community. But um, from a very early age, I identified as a feminist. And now I know why, because I liked all of these lesbians. And Billie Jean King was like my favorite tennis player. Um, but I sort of knew that there was this movement about women. And the whole idea that women wanted to control their own bodies, even as a teenager or before a teenager, I sort of got. And I didn't get involved in sort of civil rights stuff until later. But um, the fundamental sort of foundation was that I was, that I sort of felt like people were trying to control our, our bodies. And, and I think, you know, gay men have to understand that, you know, misogyny is sort of the basic root of homophobia. Mm -hmm. um, and it here, always here. has been and always will be. Um, here, and, here. and it's been an interesting road to be involved in this movement where for a long time, um, certainly back in the, in the late 80s, 90s, when we were having those big community meetings, um, there was a real split between the boys and the girls in, some, in many ways, I think. Um, and if you look back at what was happening, particularly when HIV showed up, um, a lot more men became involved because it was um, their friends who were sick, and they became radical, more radicalized. Many of the women had already been engaged, and we, I think part of that split was, as I remember it, um, there was the let's go out on the streets, and let's, uh, part of it was let's go out on the streets and, and protest, and let's sort of work the system and figure out how we're going to get things done. And more often it was the women, and not that there weren't many, plenty of radical women on the street, but more often it was, as I recall, there were the women who were organizing um, some of those more uh, professionally focused, like, let's go and change the system from within the system. I mean, you had to do both, but that was a time where, particularly when ACT UP and Queer Nation, where sort of the division between men and women was very interesting. And it, I mean, it all sort of worked out in the end, and I think that we all came close together, but there was a moment where I clearly saw uh, you know, clear distinctions. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question um, is, we are living in a moment of extreme reaction against LGBT equality at the federal policy level, as well as reaction against a lot of things that we care about, racial justice, uh, racial equality, women's rights, environmental policy, immigrants. We've seen a resurgence of anti-Semitic violence, um, you know, anti-Muslim policies from the administration and so on. So it's hard not to focus on the negative. Could you mention something positive about LGBT health that we can celebrate on this 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and the Stonewall Rebellion? And are there resiliencies that we as a community should be celebrating in terms of LGBT health? Well, I have something. Um, there is an organization called the Network La Red, which you may be familiar with. Uh, th they started about 30 years ago looking at intimate partner violence inside lesbian relationships. They very quickly expanded to include trans people, and now they're open to LGBTQ. And uh, they recently got state funding from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health for the very first time to do a survey and get some data about what is going on inside our intimate relations in terms of abuse. 
And they aimed for, they, they sort of promised the state that they'd get 1,000 people to fill out their survey so that there could be really a significant amount of data to crunch. And as of now, it's about 3,500 who have stepped up. And what I particularly loved about them was they reached out to us, the elders, and um, included us in, you know, saw us as people that were functioning in relationships and whatnot and included us in, in, in inviting us to do the survey. So I just think that's amazing that uh, the Department of Health has given them that money and assistance to, so we can find out what the debt is. I'd like to add something to what Sue just said. Uh, LARED is amazing, and they do amazing work. But I also want to give credit to Fenway and something that came out of this organization some years ago that has now helped to create a standard, at least in some of the Harvard teaching hospitals. And that has to do with the recognition of same-sex partner violence going un undiagnosed, unseen in healthcare settings. And so if we go, if you go now to uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, so let's use that because that was the institution that Fenway really worked with through uh, some former medical staff here. Um, to help create and decide that we, A, the hospital needed to talk about providing care to LGBTQ patients, that they were not just coming to Fenway, they were in the Brigham, they were at Mass General, they were, you know, because the, the, the desire sometimes to ghettoize or to place in a certain location, if you will, uh, and make systems not have to look at themselves. And this really forced BI to do some of the necessary work so that two people, let's say it's two male-identified individuals show up in an emergency room, the way in which it used to be looked at was say, oh, well, they just were having a couple of drinks and got into a fight. Mm -hmm. And that would be the, the narrative. And no one would look and never question whether or not this was a couple, was this a relationship, how often were they showing up in the emergency room, what else was going on. And so they have now embedded a protocol that many people forget came out of Fenway that gets practice and... Um, and it's interesting if you're on the other side of it. Quick story, I had taken someone I was dating at the time to the hospital for, they were having surgery, and I wanted to get all the medicines. So I'm asking, I need the prescriptions, I need to have the prescriptions so I can get those because I understand how pain is and you want to stay on top of the pain, da 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 da. And I can, they're saying to the doctor, can you get me the prescriptions so I can take care of this? Um, I got up to go to the bathroom. My boyfriend at the time said to me, you'll never guess what happened. I said, what happened? He said, the doctor asked me when you went away was, did I feel safe at home? And I had to laugh because I thought, and what did you say? Um, <laughs> but it also talked about the way in which the protocol is working. The doctor saw something, my intensity at that time, which was really caring, and asked the appropriate question. That's Fenway. And I think it's very important to, to acknowledge that piece. I think the other thing that's really important to say about resilience is that the visibility of, mm. of all of the members and the, the subgroups that make up our wonderful communities is so incredibly important just for a young person who is grappling with their sexuality or their gender identity to see role models out there. They're in the mainstream. They're on all the TV shows. They're in, they're among the politicians. They're in, you know, many of the famous people who you see written about in the news. And with the, the advent of the internet that makes it very easy to access all of this, there are role models for people everywhere, and I think that that's made a tremendous difference. Yeah, I would say one one positive thing uh, that I think that I thought I would never see in my lifetime it, it is the not only young people but children, uh, especially transgender children, coming out as children and having parents recognize that that's indeed what their identities are and are then themselves seeking uh, support. So how they can be better parents and how they can better support and affirm the gender identity of their child. And so this gives young children the opportunity from their earliest ages to, to grow up with their identities affirmed and however imperfect and we're still struggling and of course there's uh, you know, attacks from the federal level you know, all the way through, it's not an easy road, but, but for the first time we have a cohort of younger people who, who have that opportunity. So I think that's a really bright spot. Thanks, I would like to just add that I think the building of 
the alternative, alternate insemination program at Fenway and at other places is also really uh, a hallmark of what's happened over the years, that the idea uh, that prior to this time, uh, basically lesbians could not go into an in vitro fertilization clinic of any kind and expect to be treated like adult, the adult human beings that were deserving of the good treatment. And it was really, like there was no one law. I mean, ultimately there were some regulations as part of the ACA that protected transgender and, and LGBT, LGB people. But um, it was just really creating the programs, sort of tra the transformation in the way the community was viewed that just created these opportunities for families all over. And then add some of the legal professions you know, Mary Bonato probably created more health and health for the communities than anyone. But think of the work on uh, second parent adoptions that she did, the groundbreaking work to help make sure that courts could recognize the non-biologic parent, same-sex parent as a parent. Huge, huge, huge. And I, I was just said, I probably won't win any friends, but the question about abuse come has, comes out at my mass general primary care, internal medicine, practice as, are you in a relationship, you know, with someone who in any way, you know, seeks to control your activity? I'm like, have you ever been in a relationship? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, really? Is that the standard? <laughs> so, so I would answer that question that we are safer and healthier and freer than we have ever been in our history. And we're going to get more of that as we go ahead. Yes, there's a, and there's a, the backlash is to that. You know, it's not that, I mean, it wasn't better yesterday. I mean, we have this notion sometimes when we're in these times where the anti-gay folks and anti-trans folks are just, you know, having their moment. Um, and we see all these terrible policies happening in, the, in this administration. but. You know, without a doubt, we are winning the overall story here. Um, and we've got to prevent them from, you know, turning the page back. They can't turn the chapter back. Um, we're not going to, in my, I don't think, I don't, we're not going to lose marriage. Um, younger, young people now are at a place where they absolutely, without a doubt, know that they deserve to, to have everything that everybody else has. And they've lived that, they've grown that, and that's not going to change. And what's even more important, their friends also believe it. It's, and even in the South, I'm from Alabama, and my you know, 24, 21 uh, nephews and nieces have friends who come out to them. It's a very different thing than it was when we were young, which was a while ago. Um, so, you know, yes, it's tough, but um, remember, we're winning. We, we, are, we have, the further we get, the more the minority of people who are so against us harder they're going to fight. But overall, they're losing. Um, that doesn't mean that we have to we, we stop fighting one bit, um, because we do deserve to have absolute, complete, and total equality, period, in everything, in every way. Um, and that's just not, we still live in a very heterosexist society. So people don't understand what that means yet. They don't understand that society, society is completely set up and promoted for heterosexual folks. Um, and that's why we will continue to have to fight this fight until, you know, a long, long time from now. But we're winning. We are winning, and we have to be. I just want to ask a quick follow-up just to you, Gary. So the two marriage rulings were five to four votes on the court, right? right. The Windsor case and the Obergefell case. Um, we now have Gorsuch and uh, Kavanaugh on the court. You don't think it's possible that the Alliance Defending Freedom will find will challenge one of the, I don't know, one of the, I don't know what they would challenge exactly, but would challenge marriage equality somehow, whether at the federal level or the state level, and try to get something that goes up to the Supreme Court, and it could be decided differently because of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh being Federalist Society, you know, uh, acolytes. You don't think well, there's I'm any chance of that? I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, I don't argue the Supreme Court. Um, but politically, it would be the most disastrous thing that ever happened. And they, they won't, I just don't think they would happen. I don't think Roberts would let that happen 
long as he's breathing on that board. Might, just might not take up the case. Or, or, yeah. or create an opinion that leaves marriage, that leaves marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, as, as a lawyer, I would say the, um, the, the, that, the kind of chaos that sort of reversing that stuff causes is probably something they would choose to avoid. And, you know, the benefits of Roberts was at Harvard Law School. After we had a committee on gay and lesbian legal issues, after I was dancing at dances mm -hmm. with the straight people in my class with same-sex partners, Harvard Law School was transformed by the time Roberts got there into a place where gay was okay. And, you know, I think some of that's been absorbed. I think Gorsuch probably might not be a vote either for the Yeah, I know. I have, I have friends who know Gorsuch, and they don't think that would happen. Grace, you were going to say something. Oh, I was thinking in, in uh, following up on what Gary was saying about it absolutely is better, and I just was going to share an anecdote. So Bagley had its 39th annual prom uh, Friday night, and uh, and the young people had a great time. And uh, one of the photographers that uh, who has come every year, a lesbian photographer, uh, brought with her a 19-year-old assistant, and so he's there and helping, and it's sort of dawning on me, sort of figuring out that, uh, you know, he's straight, cisgender, you know, uh, and I thought, wow, look how far we have come that a straight, cisgender, 19-year-old male is volunteering or getting paid to help uh, the lesbian photographer at the queer prom, and when the songs came on and he knew all the music, you know, and went out and was dancing, and I thought he's just utterly unconcerned about what anyone would think, and, I, and I'm thinking that's just a moment of progress. That's great. Thank you. Um, Gary uh, Bailey, you mentioned you were on Chris Lydon's radio show a few weeks ago along with Sue Katz uh, and Michael Bronsky. And um, you mentioned the importance of moving from the term homosexual to the term gay when you were a young college student here in Boston. Um, advocates worked very hard with the New York Times in the 80s to get them to stop referring to gay men and lesbians as homosexuals, and to refer to us as, as gay men and lesbians. Um, why was this important, and, and, and how, like, how did it affect you personally, this shift from homosexual to gay? What did it mean? And, um, how is self-determination regarding language related to LGBT health and LGBT well-being? I, I think that, for me, that's the, most, the more important question, is about self-determination. It is. Um, the ways in which we think about, uh, at least I thought about at the time, homosexual was a sterile clinical term devoid of humanity. It was about looking at and examining a symptom, not a human being. Uh, and it, it was, it, and I, going down when you were trying to find, there was no way you turned on your television or any of those sorts of things to find yourself, which is also what Jenny and what Gary were, were talking about. So you'd go to the library to try to figure out where do, you, where do you find yourself. And you'd find yourself in these horrible books, um, textbooks, um, that talked about the homosexual as a deviant, as uh, someone, something to be avoided, something to be cured, something to be treated, something to be this. Who wants to be that? And it was um, disempowering. And there was something about um, the term gay that was affirming, um, it, was, uh, it, it was affirming, it was empowering, it was freeing, and it was ours. And it is not dissimilar to, you know, I will say sometimes to my students when we talk about race, you know, I was, I was born colored, that's on my birth certificate, I became Negro, then I became black, then, and at each of those iterations, Someone pushes back against it to say, oh, now I'm confused. It's really about people being able to call themselves who they want to be called and identified by. I can remember the old jokes we gave. Well, you know, everybody's happy as if that was a great joke. And it, it's making fun of something, but without people understanding what it means to name yourself. Uh, in the same way that young people today are, people are, are using the word queer. You know, queer for certain of us across the generation was, it's, it's, a, it's a word that causes some conflict. Um, but it's really about people's ability and right to be able to call themselves how they wish to be called. And can we dialogue sometimes with people about the history of the word, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have 
uh, importance and presence. And so it's really the power of language uh, to be able to call yourself whatever you want to be called. Right? Yes. Um, gay is a word I always felt like the men appropriated it from all of us because when I was coming up, I mean before Stonewall, we said gay girls. We were always saying, you know, the, the gay girls, that's what we said. I still say gay, you know, gay liberation, and I mean me. And, uh, but it's become, you know, when you see it, people think they're talking only about gay men. And as for queer, in our first collective, we, the first collective in Boston, the first lesbian collective in Boston, um, one of the girls uh, took the name Kathy Queer, and that was her name. Queer was not a negative, I don't know, we didn't experience of it as a negative thing. And in fact, we put out the first gay newspaper uh, in Boston, it was called The Lavender Vision, and we put out the first issue, because we didn't have enough money, with this collective of guys we knew who were called Radical Fairies. Uh, so, language that, you know, la language is, is um, what's elastic. the word? Thank you, elastic. <laughs> so, okay, just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to just give pithy comments, but when I arrived in Boston from New York City in 1973 as a 17-year-old freshman at MIT, I had come there because I had gone to visit the school in the previous January and saw a bulletin board with, for the gay student group. I thought, great, they, they're with it. But the name of the gay group when I got there was the MIT Student Homophile League. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we used to go around you know, to talk to people about our issues. This, you're hemophiliacs? <laughs> and, I, and it was like, first, the irony no longer lost on no, how we no, connected no. to that community. But it was just like, I, don't, I never found out like, whose idea that was. Uh, but then we changed it to Gamut. That was from the Philly group, the very first group. Oh, that's right. That's, that's from the homophile. Philly group, the homophile, homophile. Yeah. yeah. That was from the 50s. Right. I think even the late 40s, maybe. Yeah. But anyway, it's just like... The other thing that's... We're naming ourselves ridiculous things, too, sometimes. <laughs> The other thing that's sort of fun about terminology is that it can be used in an act up kind of a way. And I'm, I'm thinking back to when I was in my first year in medical school and there was a group of somewhat older role models who were lesbians and they called themselves dyke doctors. This is a group that still sort of exists, but it was a little bit shocking, but it was also, we're out there, you know? And, uh, and we used to announce this name to people who were pretty appalled by the word dyke, and we would kind of enjoy the fact that it would be pushing at people. My fundamental identity is as a dyke, always has been. That's great, thank you. Um, so, Sue, you and others, um, could you please address the health and policy implications uh, of a growing population of LGBT people who are now in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and even older. How are LGBT older adults experiencing the health care system and the elder service system? And what are some of the most pressing issues facing the Stonewall generation and their ability to access quality care? So I, I, I said I've been through a lot of movements all my life, I've been an activist, but now I'm working around the issues of LGBT elders and our needs, and our needs are, turns out, uh, amplified from the needs of, of other elders. I'm in my 70s. And uh, the, the, one of the biggest problems and biggest threats to our health is the isolation of LGBT elders. I mean, that's a problem for all elders. However, if you look at the numbers, 90% of gay seniors, and I mean people my age, which I call the pioneer generation because we started gay liberation, um, or this iteration of it, 90% of gay seniors do not have children and therefore no grandchildren. That's compared with 20% of the general population. 34% of gay seniors live alone as opposed to 24%, 23% uh, in the general population. What you have to understand is that when it comes time for home care, which it's going to come time for, 80% uh, of that home care is provided by family. For many of us, we don't have a relationship with our bio families. I don't have a relationship with my bio families. They were shits when I was a, a kid, 
and got caught, I mean, I'm talking 64, 65, uh, and, you know, they, they are dead to me. So I don't have a bio family. I live alone. Uh, you know, I don't have kids or grandkids. I'm like, uh, I, I'm like the poster child for an isolated senior, except that I'm a writer. I, all of my stuff is about the lives and loves of, of uh, LGBT elders. Buy my books, please. And, and I'm, you know, a dancer and I'm, you know, vital and I'm fine until I'm not. And I'm in my 70s. When I'm not fine, I've got nobody. This is why intergenerational, intergener an intergenerational, a consciously intergenerational movement is so important to us and to the young people who need this history and to know, need to know this stuff and to need to have the skills that we developed you know, about the closet. Let me talk about the closet. I lived in the closet. I know all about the closet. And now our elders are being forced back into the closet that they defined. The whole concept of coming out didn't exist before Stonewall. We created the concept of coming out, and we came out, and we were courageous. And now, let's say you're home, you're sick, you're after, you know, I need, I need uh, a full knee replacement, for example. But I don't get it because I have no way to get care. Let's say I have to get an agency to come into my house. And those are just strangers. And they may have religious views. They may have feels about all the shit I have around the walls and all the pictures that I have. So I've got to, like, put them away. That's what we did. That was what we did back in the day. We would have a drawer where you quickly took down all the pictures off the wall and off the top of the counter. And you stuck them away because somebody's parent turned up and you you know, made up the couch to look like a bed and uh, suddenly, you know, you were covered. That That's going to happen to us again. That is happening to us again. And you brought up institutions. I mean, you go into a nursing home or even a hospital and people may have views about you. And if they have those views, you are at your most vulnerable. And if you don't have family that are looking after you, Who's looking after you? And this goes down even to the level of who's going to help you turn over your mattress when you need it. So I, I could talk about this all day. but Oh, I just want to say one other thing. All the institutions that are out there for elders, like senior centers and like assisted living, all of those places, uh, there is a project out of Fenway, the LGBT Aging Project, where I do a lot of speaking with them. Um, and they go around and they try to train people that are working with elders about our issues, these kinds of issues, and the fears that people have, that we have when we go into these institutions. But the staff of all those institutions are paid minimum wage. They've got no benefits. They are mistreated, they are overworked, they are disrespected, and they're gone. And then there's a new generation, and then a new generation. So that kind of training works maybe at a level of staff that are going to stick around, but the actual care workers, um, it's an issue. And as for chosen families, most of our chosen families are our age, and we're all taking care of each other the best we can. But for many, many uh, gay male elders, their whole generation was wiped out by AIDS. Their networks were wiped out, and they're kind of bereft of, of their own uh, networks as well. So don't allow us to be invisible and take us in. Consider us. Adopt me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, I'll just add that the. LGBT Aging Project, which is great, we, were, we did some work with to assess the training. And while it's true there's turnover, one of the key factors is getting leadership to buy into yeah, the changes so that it sustains institutionally yeah. and to look at systems and things that can, you know. And one of the women who ran one of the agencies said a great thing when we were doing these interviews, uh, and we did publish it, um, the article. Uh, but she said, well, at least this is what she said to me, whether it's true or not. She said, my staff can have whatever feelings about gay LGBT people they want to have, but while they work in this agency, the professional thing is to treat them absolutely like everybody else and keep their feelings to themselves, yeah. at least in terms of the, uh, uh, the treat working with the clients. Look at that. I spilled all the water. And it's just sitting there. Uh, 
The other thing I wanted to add about aging was the uh, HIV side of things. So I'm on several listservs for some of the national partnerships around HIV, and, and activists are on them as well as you know just everyone. And one activist researcher has really made it his job to highlight all of the research studies and issues that they've identified related to HIV and aging. So, I, and I've been living with HIV since 1985. And so like every day, you know, I get on the list of, I almost like start laughing about it. Like, okay, my brain is gonna deteriorate faster. My cardiovascular system is gonna deteriorate faster. My chances of certain <laughs> cancers. Okay, we know HIV hurts the immune system. It's not good. You get a lot of problems. Boy, there's a lot of money in HIV for people to research everything and HIV, which I do too, so I'm not complaining. But it's just, uh, it's a little demoralizing at some point to keep reading that stuff. And, 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 there are, and the activists are like, so what are we doing? What's the program? And how are we going to fight this? It's like, nobody's doing anything about much of this stuff, and nobody's well, really going to be able to. I just want to mention one positive thing that's happening here in Massachusetts. We're the first state that now have, we now have a law that requires all elder service workers to be trained in the unique needs and experiences of LGBT older adults. And um, the LGBT Aging Project folks, Lisa Krinsky and Bob Linscott, uh, which is part, the LGBT Aging Project is part of the Family Institute. Um, they're working with some folks at BU School of Public Health to develop a, a curriculum for all those staff to be trained. So um, I realize there's a lot of work to do and that's just one piece of it. But we also are the only state with a statewide LGBT aging commission. So Grace serves on the youth commission, but we also have a statewide LGBT aging commission. And we're working very closely with elder affairs to kind of try to address different things. We're trying to uh, help them do data collection, to be collect sexual orientation, gender identity data, so that we can understand how do LGBT elders experience systems? Are they less likely to go to senior centers? Are they less likely to go to congregate meal programs? Um, are they having difficulties with home care aides coming into their homes? So we're, so we're gradually going to be able to answer some of those questions. I just wanted to add one thing. I just wanted to sort of also take a moment to acknowledge Judy Bradford, who among the many, many, many things she's done and she did was bring help incorporate the LGBT aging project into Fenway mm -hmm. and to really um, help mobilize it in terms of more research, more evidence-based activities and, and and if I could add to what you said about Massachusetts in Massachusetts we have more things happening for LGBT elders than I think anywhere in the world I mean wherever I travel I was in Amsterdam uh, last year or the year before and people were like astounded because we have for example OLOC old lesbians organizing for change we have monthly panel sessions that attract 40 to 50 women every time we have an organization rally that's a social group for uh, that has monthly events for have you know besides on top of the LGBT aging project we uh, we have the elders of color the LGBT elders of color a big group an active group uh, who has at least a monthly event to break isolation and bring people together and they've built an incredible uh, welcoming community and we have I think it's now 24 meals monthly meals across the state where we, we all get together and we get these subsidized meals. I mean, my closest one is Cambridge. Uh, we go to the SNS Deli, we pay $4, and we get a fabulous meal crowded into this little room. Um, come next week if you'd like. I'm doing a reading of my new book. Uh, so we have in Massachusetts, we are so far ahead of the game, and I attribute part of that to the, f the film Gen Silent. Mm -hmm which if you haven't seen, go see, um, which woke up a lot of people uh, and uh, you know, did a brilliant job. I, th I think it was one of the first things that the Aging Project did and it was, it's brilliant. Right, and it was filmed here in Boston yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, great, thank you. Um, Jenny Potter, you have led efforts to transform clinical care education to increase LGBT health research and to develop best practices for caring for LGBT patients, especially sexual minority women and transgender patients. Could you talk about the current state of this kind of LGBT health advocacy and where you see it going in the future? And what is the role of the community 
the LGBT community in LGBT health professional education, and how are you transforming that role? Um, the first thing that I'll talk about has to do with empowerment. It, it really gets back to the idea that, um, that we should be in, in control of our own bodies. Um, and one of the, the very most interesting developments over um, the whole sexually transmitted infection movement has been the development of ways to screen for sexually transmitted infections that are within an individual's control. It doesn't require a doctor to go poking a swab in places that you don't want a swab to be put. You can now be screened by doing it yourself. Um, increasingly by mail-in kits that you can do in the privacy of your own home. So this is um, an enormous benefit, and we're starting to see this come into the realm of cervical cancer screening with pap tests, too, uh, and I think we'll be seeing a more and more of this kind of a thing. All of this happened in part because we, as, as researchers, started to realize how important it is to invite community members in and find out what it is that they needed for their own health care. So um, there is a requirement now for clinical trials to involve community members, at least in some phase of the research. And if it's done really well, it means in all phases of the research, where you have community advisory boards that are intricately involved in deciding what questions actually need to be studied and designing the trials in thinking about how to advertise them to community members in a responsible way. Um, to um, analyzing the results as they come in, to disseminating those results back to the community members so that they can understand what those results mean and how they apply to them. So this is a really important piece in the research that has helped our health. I think the same thing is also happening in the health professional education, and we're seeing across the country now in medical schools, but also in other health profession schools, nursing schools, physician assistant schools, and the like, we're seeing community members being brought in as well to advise on what we should be teaching these budding health professionals, how we should be teaching them, and probably most importantly, how we should evaluate them before they graduate and actually end up providing the care to make sure that they actually learned it and can do it right. And we're doing one of these things just for one example at Harvard Medical School has a new initiative to weave sexual and gender minority health threads throughout the four-year curriculum. And it will involve bringing in a community advisory board like this to help us actually teach the material and make sure that our graduates are competent to take care of us when they finish. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay. The next question is for Grace, but others can answer. Same with uh, Jenny's question. Um, Grace, could you please address the importance of involving LGBT youth and transgender communities in LGBTQ uh, health research and advocacy? How is this best accomplished? Also, your career has uh, focused on improving structural drivers of vulnerability for LGBT youth like homelessness and you know, uh, involvement in the juvenile justice system. Could you talk about how broader policy frameworks, such as youth policy, affect the health and well-being of LGBT youth? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, when I talk about the needs of LGBT young people, I usually start with reminding people that they're young people first. And so a lot of the challenges that they're experiencing is, is being minors, being you know, part of families where they're, they may not want their families to know about their identities or their sexual activities or the communities they're involved in. Uh, they're, they're, they're subject, they might be in their parents' insurance, so they might, they might have family situations that are really unsafe or not stable. So when we're starting with what, what, how do we best serve LGBTQ youth, we have to start with the fact that what are the challenges that face most young people in, in our communities? And, and a lot of those have to do with the, the family situation that they come from, the relative stability and safety, and then if you add to that then the, their LGBT identities, then they're coming out. And, and of course, we live in a culture that is sex negative, and especially when we think 
to children and youth. Uh, there is such a sense that children and young people are not sexual, and they certainly shouldn't be having sexual activity, engaging in sexual activity. And of course, they are. And so, what we know is that uh, you know I'm very proud of the fact that Bagley took a leadership role from the very beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Bagley was actually started the year before in 1980. And so, I remember, and I remember in 1981, in sitting in our first year of a, a Bagley meeting, and a young person coming in and saying, "Did you hear? Did you hear about the gay cancer?" And and that that started what we were beginning to hear that this evolving sense of what was happening out there. And we certainly had concerns that young people might not come out, would be afraid to come out. What would this mean? And of course, it, it didn't change that. But it did mean that Bagley, <clears throat> Bagley had to take a leadership role in making sure that young people are educated. So our very model has been about peer leadership, young people educating other young people about their health needs. And yes, LGBT young people are making babies too. And so that another link to the women's health movement and reproductive rights has been recognizing that teaching young people about their bodies, about issues of consent, about issues of power and, and relationships, and and the, the many ways that young people form relationships just like adults. So I think when we're looking at serving young people in need safe spaces that young people feel safe in, where they, where they have trusted peers and adults and have access to supportive referrals for treatment. And, and, and certainly Bagley at this stage of our development has a sexual health clinic that we, uh, that we have it with funding from the Department of Public Health in collaboration with the Borum, Sydney Borum uh, Health Clinic here at, at Fenway. And so we actually have an on-site HIV testing, STI screening, and, and treatment and referral for treatment. Um, I would add also, you talked about a transgender community, and, and uh, a difference here is that for many trans people, not all, not all trans, transgender people are seeking medical transition, uh, but for those who are, the, the, the needs around health care are very different than their cisgender peers, whether or not their cisgender peers are heterosexual or gay, lesbian, or bi. And so the, they interface with the health care system differently if ultimately they they're seeking uh, hormonal treatment or if they're seeking surgeries or other forms of medical care. Uh, again, what's changed now is that at such an early age that when we have children and we know that gender identity is, is set and identified at a much earlier age than sexual orientation, so even as young as three, four, five-year-old children, they know whether they are a boy or a girl or, or neither or either or both, even if they don't always have the language to describe that. And for the first time, we have parents and adults who are recognizing that, who are not dismissing it or ignoring it or, or saying it's just a phase, um, but it's still a challenge. You know, it, it's a challenge for parents of, of trans children to not be seen as pushing their agenda on their children, uh, the concern that decisions may be made that might be irreversible. What if the young person changes their mind later? There's so many uh, ethical questions when you're talking about children and young adolescents. So when we're, when to, to answer your question around what are some of the advocacy efforts, it's around all of those issues. It's around legal issues. It's around ethical issues. It's around empowerment of uh, uh, younger people at an age when we aren't usually thinking they're old enough to be making decisions or, or uh, making those decisions themselves and what is informed consent and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think this is where there's, where particularly around the transgender uh, folks and young people, it, it becomes the cutting edge of the work that, that we're looking at in the healthcare system. Um, I'll just add that, I'm, I'll, I think for the next question I'm going to talk more about this, but that uh, HIV and, and certain LGBT health issues have really driven some things in the healthcare system. And one that I'll, I'll point out here is that um, youth have rights in Massachusetts and other places to get HIV tested and to have family planning services. So again, LGBT health and women's health without having to have parental consent. And now they're considering several laws that would model on those laws for vaccines because of what's happening now with the vaccine movement. So we see a lot of the things that were sort of made more innovative through the movement, the health movements we're talking about now echoing throughout the system in other ways. Gary. 
No, I was just going to say, I think the, the, the question is how do we involve them. <laughs> really, it's the young people who will lead us. You know, it's not, we're not, it's, it's always young people. We were young back then, we were talking about back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. We were a lot younger then. And so the, <laughs> we were, um, so the next iteration of what will happen in this movement is not really for us to define. Um, it's for us to sort of advise or whatever, but it's really, uh, and I think it's important, as I said before, to remember the perspective that people are coming from now as opposed to the perspective that some of us came from. Like they, these are people who have never been in the closet. So the whole concept is sort of like riding on the back of the bus. I mean, you said it to me, I'm like, what the hell? Like, this, it's just not in my experience. I mean, I know the history, but you know, I was one of the beneficiaries of that civil rights movement. It's like I've never had for a minute I've never thought that I was in any way inferior to white people. Um, and that's the way gay people, LGBTQ people are now. It's like, we deserve to have absolutely everything as everybody else. Like, what's wrong with you people? And so that, just that perspective will create, I think, a different way of being um, and way of leading, you know, uh, into the future. I also, it's very important for those of us who, and I agree with you, Gary, on that as well. I think times have changed, and we have to look at the, the way in which times have changed. Uh, it's very important for those of us who are on this side of the movement to be able to acknowledge the contributions and the history, but not to tie the future to our past. It's very important because it, it won't look like that. But I also, and I also think it's very important for those of us who sit in cities to understand that our world is still very different. There are places that it doesn't look that different. There are little towns and little hamlets in places all across this country, and not just the South, not just the Midwest, right here in Massachusetts. Uh, if you go to the western part of the state, the Cape, or not, maybe not that far from here, where there's still kids who don't feel it's okay. There still are people who are in marriages that they felt was a great cover for them and that was the way they had to exist and they can't find their way out. I, I don't want those, those stories, those narratives to get lost, that lived reality to get lost um, because there are those people in those places for whom Stonewall still hasn't happened. And that's the important, to me, the important thing is to never forget that those individuals exist and, and for us not to blame them for their existence. And I mean blame in quotation marks, air quotes, but we can sometimes become a little um, privileged. Right. Didn't you get the memo? Right. Didn't you get the memo? And, and gee, what, who, where were you? Right. And it's not just um, rural situations. Wasn't it the Bronx where a teenager was just bullied and killed himself yeah. uh, for being gay just like a couple weeks ago? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So we're going to ask two more questions and we're going to open up to the audience. Um, we've already touched on HIV. It sort of came up organically in the conversation. So I'll just um, try to ask a couple of uh, pieces of this question. So, um, could you talk a little bit about how the response to HIV helped transform the LGBT community, but also how it helped transform the healthcare system? Maybe I'll start on that. And, and, I, and I, I admit I'm using this question to make a couple of points that I wanted to make, but this is where it kind of fits. So as I said before, I do think that a lot that happened under H, during, as part of the HIV Epidem AIDS epidemic has had a huge effect on us in terms of the LGBT rights movement generally and then in terms of medicine more broadly. Uh, so things like uh, expedited drug approvals or allowing more compassionate use of drugs during while well, people were facing a, a potentially deadly illness or deadly illness uh, that, you know, has been kind of taken up by uh, breast cancer advocates and many, many other health advocates. Uh, but I also think that data collection is just something I'd like to say a word about, because I do think that being able to have data, and Kevin Cranston, who directs the Bureau of Infectious Diseases, the Mass Department of Public Health, is in the back. Hi, Kevin. And it was really one of the, he was one of the people who, like, 
you know, took the pedal to the metal, like really got the wheels on the ground. I mean, he really got those questions about sexual orientation and later gender identity or expression onto like state and federally sponsored health and social services surveys. And um, it just made, made a huge difference. And I think HIV facilitated that because again, sort of if you go to the HIV time, most of our health was still sexual health and STDs, you know, for a lot of people. Uh, and, and then you look and you say, well, we don't know who, who these people are. Are they gay? Are they straight? Who are they having sex with? Men, women, both, trans people later. So I think trying to understand the HIV epidemic and collect data helped pave the way for more acceptability of asking questions about those SOGI, as they're called, measures, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, on surveys, which has really just been a, a huge burgeoning piece of uh, data and evidence that have allowed now a couple of generations of researchers to begin to research and publish on LGBT health disparities. How has HIV transformed the healthcare system, and also how is it? How did it affect the LGBT community? Um, so, yeah, how did it affect the LGBT community? I, I really believe that um, HIV, the HIV movement, the response to HIV, jump started the movement, um, or pushed us over a certain point. I mean, there's a big difference between what if you look at what happened between uh, 1989, when Massachusetts passed this, the second gay and lesbian civil rights law. There was one passed in Wisconsin in 1992, but it was sort of an odd. 83. 80, 80, 80, 82. 82, 82, 82 yeah. yeah, sorry, 82. We passed in 89. Um, but between 89 and 2000, those 10 years, there's probably never been a faster civil rights movement speeding ahead. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. Um, but it's also the time where we went from having essentially kind of no hope in HIV to, you know, the Lazarus effect. Uh, people sort of dying one day and the next day people were all of a sudden thriving again. Um, to HIV being a chronic manageable disease. Um, and the number of new infections going from 100,000 a year, uh, each year to, we're still stuck at like 38 or 40 in the country. But um, So those what? things, 38,000, 30, 38, 40,000 yes. in the country, yeah. Uh, so those two things, those two things happened at the same time, and I and I think they Im influenced each other um, because the country got more comfortable with gay people, um, and at the same time more comfortable with HIV, and it's the two are very closely, in my view, in my mind, the two are very closely connected. Um, But for some communities, and, and more recently, when I think about black gay men, um, and in 1993 when we went to the State Department of Public Health to say we need to put money towards black and Latino gay men, the person at the department said, that's not an issue for black and Latino men. HIV is not an issue. Well, he, and this was a heterosexual man. Um, but he was also really saying that there's not any black and gay uh, men. Uh, black and Latino men. So, um, now of course, the person who was running the department was overruled that and started to put money towards it, um, black and Latino men, and now it's obviously a priority. But I think HIV among black gay men allowed, pe also, as in the as in the broader community, but allowed people to start to identify themselves as being gay and having to do the work around HIV. It went s more slowly. And in the broader white community, um, and to a certain extent, because we had a, uh, because there was this firm belief, this belief that HIV wasn't affecting black gay men, coupled with the notion that there weren't, that there were not black gay people or Latino gay people, um, is why, to, in my view, um, and other cultural issues, why we're and racism, that we're we're behind, and that you know we have a population that's most burdened by the epidemic now are young black gay men. Um, but even so, uh, without the LGBTQ movement, we would be even further back. We would have we made absolutely no advance, I think, in that community. Um, so the two things are very closely tied together. Um, 
and certainly the actual, just as simple, the funding of HIV organizations and programming was the funding of LGBT in both, in all communities, funding of, the, of, of basically, even though people weren't, you're not allowed to use money to advocate or if it's public money. But I mean, the fact is we used to go to the Fenway Community Health Development Department and call our legislators to say, this vote's coming up and call people and tell them to, to call their legislators. So there, that was happening all around. People who were in LGBT groups were very much involved in HIV. If, if they're in nonprofits, they still were help, helping us to push along civil rights movement, the civil rights movement. And if they're in the civil rights movement, still helping us move along HIV women. So they were, they were very closely aligned, I think, and it's, it's hard to sort of tease them apart specifically, like when, at what point, one was more instrumental in where we are now. Um, but both, I think, were very important. I agree with uh, everything that, that Gary said, and it, it makes me think about all of the other things that happened. It, it also meant that we took control of our own, uh, own lives. I'm not going to say destiny, but our own lives, and began doing what the government wasn't doing. We began putting our money. We began raising money. We began, uh, you know, we, I, I can remember putting on shows. I mean, it, it felt like Judy and... Mickey, Mike, whatever his name, Mickey Rooney in the barn, but putting on a show to raise money because we needed money and we couldn't wait for other people to do it. It also helped uh, a community to understand that we could have political clout, um, that we did have financial, uh, some financial resources that could be used uh, for our own community. We built our own systems because no one else was doing it. Um, so, you know, we went to uh, churches that had been uh, for many years our enemies and realized that there were places where we could find some support, not all but many, uh, some, and it began to work um, with those systems. And out of that, and I would also think educate, what we did was to educate healthcare providers because there was such fear amongst healthcare providers of nurses who wouldn't go into people's rooms, of dietitians who wouldn't take in people's food, uh, people who were put in isolation in rooms all by themselves. So what it meant to go to visit a friend and have to put on a hazmat suit and a mask um, to go into a room where no one had been seen. And so you're, you're looking like this, this ghost-like specter as you're going into someone's room. Um, I think that our intervention, our lack of fear, our belief our lack of obvious fear, we were afraid, but it was our lack of obvious fear or our sense of what it meant to be part of a community and to love our own, um, help push the needle a bit around what I think of as being a slight shift in more comprehensive, kinder healthcare delivery in crisis. Um, and I think that that's an important takeaway from all of this, that lots of people had to change the way in which they thought about doing this kind of work. And what the ultimate change was when people began to know people who were not a patient, but it was a friend. It took the, it took the, it, the, it made the, the patient the personal, and that always is gonna change care, the way care is given. That, that to me was a positive outcome about a very horrible, a horrible period. Thank you. Uh, the last question, actually, Gary Daffin, you sort of started talking about the issue of intersectionality. And I just wanted to ask a question about that. Uh, so you talked a bit about HIV and the disproportionate burden on black, gay, and bisexual men in particular, as well as Latino, gay, and bisexual men, transgender women who are black and Latina. Um, w the question is, what role has intersectionality played in our movement, and how does it play out in terms of our work to advance greater understanding and attention to LGBT health? So you know, like somebody mentioned breast cancer. That's a huge issue for women in our community. And we know that there are disparities with uh, black women in the US uh, and Latina women being much less likely to get mammograms. That's true of lesbian and bisexual women uh, of all races, but probably especially black and Latina, lesbian and bisexual women. Um, pap tests, same thing, lower rates of screenings for both women of color and sexual minority women. So maybe we could talk a bit about intersectionality, then we'll open it up to you. 
Well, intersectionality is a new concept. <laughs> 20 years ago, we weren't talking about intersectionality in the LGBTQ community, and there weren't a whole lot of black and Latino folks who were that engaged um, in the sort of mainstream. And I, I remember, like, we have a mutual friend, Douglas, uh, who likes to say that when he came to Boston, two of the people he met that influenced him the most were the two Garys. Because we were like the two, we were two black gay men who were completely out and putting our name in the paper. I remember when I started, when I became co-chair of MJLPC, um, I, other black people would ask me, why would you want to put your name in the paper and saying that you're gay? And I was like, because I'm gay, and it's not really a big deal. Um, but people had a lot more to lose. I mean, we talk about intersectionality. When there's such discrimination against gay people, black people, Latino people, they have not only to worry about discrimination based on their sexual orientation, but also discrimination based on their race. And so there's a lot more at risk. Um, and I think that's why we didn't see as many people so engaged. And some of us were fortunate enough to either work in, uh, well, A, to just not care what people thought, but also to, to be able to work in organizations or places that we could do whatever we want. Like I always had jobs where I could also go do lobbying, I could go do work on campaigns and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, I don't, I think it's a lot different now than it was then. Um, and that impact, the impact is that we, have, we see a much larger burden of HIV and other health issues among people of color in general, but particularly among black women, you talk about HIV, um, because of all of the various issues that people have to deal with that prevent them from either accessing care or preventing themselves from, you know, getting HIV or STIs, you know, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a terrific new prevention tool, the people who need it most are the people who are using it the least. Um, so black gay men, black and Latino gay men are the people who need this tool the most, but they have the least amount of access to it for a number of reasons, for all the structural reasons around health insurance um, and the fact that, you know, you have to go to your doctor and say, I have sex with men. Um, and I have anal sex with men, um, and I want this. I want this tool. And we've had lots of young people come into our office when we're testing them, and, and they're uncomfortable talking to their doctors. And we say, "Well, fire your doctor." Um, and their response is, "I can do that." And they have no idea like how the system works, like what is actually going on. So there's intersectionality. I think is you know kind of a word that kind of the thing that everybody wants to talk about. Um, which is a word that the people who experience the most, uh, 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 how would you say, who are the most burdened by things, by health challenges, that intersectional issues promote, don't have any idea what the word intersectionality means. They just know that they don't have a job, they don't have, good, they don't have access to, to health care, um, they're, you know, trying their best to protect themselves, but because there's such a prevalence of HIV among their sexual network that their risk is much higher than other people's. Um, and so, you know, I think we're just beginning to sort of understand um, how to address <coughs> issues of intersectionality and how they relate to um, risk and keeping healthy. Um, so, I don't think I, I don't think we can really, we can really answer that question yet. Yeah, uh, you know, Sojourner Truth, uh, Ain't I a Woman is an, 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 an a, a um, what is the word, um, intersectional uh, statement. If you think about, Audre Lorde was talking about intersectionality before anyone else when she talked about, you know, that someone wants us to choose one of the things that we are, we're either butch, we're either a dyke, we're either this, we're either that, uh, and someone wants you to underline it when we're all of those things. That to me is the intersectional lens. Intersectionality has always been with us before Kimberly Crenshaw named it and claimed it. It's always been there that we stand in a variety of spaces and places all the time. Sometimes they compete with one another that make it very hard um, to um, uh, to make, to negotiate with the world or to make peace with yourself or to make peace with the world or whatever, but it's, 
that, it, that part isn't new. Um, and the thing about intersectionality, it, intersectionality now to me as a social scientist, it's always interesting with these terms. Um, intersectionality, diversity, bias, all of these terms, once they get grabbed by the mainstream, I no longer know what they mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it becomes a shortcut to avoid having the real discussions. And so now what do we mean when we're talking about intersectional? Um, is it enough to just say that it's intersectional and therefore I don't have to think about mm -hmm. how it all connects? And so I've named it, therefore I never have to think about it again. Uh, people go up and, and the new one is now people talking about equity. What does that mean? I know what it means to me, but I know what it means in, in the journals, et cetera. But what does it mean in terms of practice and theory? Um, so it's not new. And it's going to be very important for systems, um, this system, my system, a university system, other systems, that really are not as expansive because we entered through our skill set. You know, Fenway is healthcare. Um, and so that, that, in some ways, focuses its its lens on that area and may not focus as much on some of the other um, counter-leaving um, issues that affect. So I would not necessarily think that Fenway will be the leader on Boston race relations, but our patients exist in, in a climate that's toxic. So how do we begin to think about fixing the whole or how do we partner with people so that we can be part of coalitions that will fix the whole? Um, so I guess, Technically, this isn't really intersectionality, but I do want to sort of say, given the access to data we have, one of the things we know now is that bisexual people are about equal to gay and lesbian people in numbers on, when reported on the demographically representative samples. And I think we've still done a poor job. I mean, you could almost think of bisexuals as having intersectionality because they live perhaps in the gay and lesbian world and perhaps in the straight world. Uh, and, you know, and yet there's still this big struggle. Every five, 10 years, bisexual is on the cover of a magazine and back, and, and, and yet there's still a lot of negative feelings. I mean, I heard it this week, someone saying, are there really bisexual people? I mean, it's just still rampant. And we just haven't really addressed that. And I do think, and also when you start to talk about down low, um, you know, there's some great national black F, uh, male researchers. I mean, there are plenty of others. Lisa Boleg is, of course, a leader in intersectionality. But um, people have done really great work at thinking about, uh, you know, the worlds that, you know, that uh, men of color particularly inhabit, where they are often in relationships with people of both gender and, and, and women. Bisexual women have the worst health outcomes of any of the groups in general about when we can have enough data to break down among the different groups and we don't really have a, a good set of programs and uh, protocols for really working well with bisexual people, I think that's a place we can do a lot more. Thank you. I'm now going to ask my colleague Tim Wang to uh, travel around the room and uh, let you ask your questions for the panel. Thank you all for your collective wisdom. It's just great to have you here and hold all this history with such a great panel. We're thinking about as this new generation of people start to age out of this history of LGBT rights. Um, you know, you see younger people now, millennials, who grew up in an era with back-to-back uh, -back Obama administrations where uh, gay marriage was an accepted part of their life and they didn't um, experience the AIDS crisis or Stonewall was like World War II. Um, are, is there, and I appreciate what you've said about that they should, they should have a different perspective, but is there is there a concern about uh, losing our history as we evolve forward? And are there things we can take from the civil rights movement and from the women's rights movement as those groups move into maturity that we should be learning from those rights movements? If I could uh, relate to that, um, not only is there is it really important to pe for people to have a handle on, on what is fundamentally their own history, 
um, but they're hungry for it. And they uh, really hungry for it. I speak a lot to, to younger people. I speak every year to BU. They have a group called Q, which is their queer group. And um, I tell them that when I went to BU in 1965 as a 17 year old freshman, uh, <laughs> fresh person, um, we women were suspended for uh, wearing pants anywhere on campus, even the common rooms of the dorms. Women had a curfew of 10 o'clock at night on the weekdays and 12 o'clock at night on the weekends, and et cetera, et cetera. When I tell these kids this, you know, today, they're like, their minds are blown. And it really, really helps contextualize what their own lives are like in, in, in the dorms and in the school um, when they know the kinds of fights that, that had to be made at what level they had to be made in my own lifetime. Like, I'm right there, I'm telling them, when I started a college. So it, it has a lot of meaning, a lot of meaning. I would, I would offer and add to that, there's a paucity of awareness about history at all in this country. Um, as as a, a professor of graduate students I, who teaches social policy, I'm always amazed when my students who've gone to some of the best schools in the country come in with a very limited historical understanding. So I'm trying to talk about the ideology of the English poor laws and why they matter now because you can see the worthy and unworthy poor and da 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 and taking that back to the pilgrims and then going back to Elizabethan England and it's as if there's been an eclipse of the sun. <laughs> But if you don't understand how, you can't, un if you don't understand why, you can't understand how. Um, or one day joking with my students about, well, you know, the Supreme Court, when people, they make a ruling, they just send out their army. And the army enforces it. And you know how you look at a room and you think, oh, God, you believe that. <laughs> That's not true. That's not what happens. Oh. So if we don't understand that collective history, which is suspect because history belongs to the victors who write it, um, we also then, it's going to be really hard to understand the history of your population, your, your group. Uh, and when we look at the history of Stonewall, this 50th anniversary is people reclaiming the actual history it was of, of what it wasn't. It was not a white, tight male in a white t-shirt, tight t-shirt, fighting in the bar. It was black and brown, outcast, marginalized people who threw the first punches and who fought. Um, and who basically had nothing to lose. Uh, those people who had something to lose weren't there. And so that narrative, you know, it, we're now in a place where everybody was at Stonewall the same way everybody marched with King. Um, I don't believe that one either. And so it's important to tell that piece of this as well because people forget that. And Stonewall wasn't the first. Um, and those are the other missing pieces, you know, the same way that Rosa Parks wasn't the first. So we, there's lots of stuff that we need to do. Yeah, I would agree. I think that uh, our community is one of the, the very few that can't learn the, their history from their parents or their grandparents for the most part. It is, uh, certainly there are LGBT parents. but uh, And so they have to learn it from people who may not may be family by blood. And, and therefore, we have to be more intentional. There isn't the natural opportunities of sharing and passing, passing along history. And it's also ironic, because in the age of the internet and social media, young people have access to more information at a younger age any generation in history, and yet how do they make sense of that? How do they know what is factual and what is just an opinion piece, and how do they piece it all together with some kind of coherent narrative? Information is out there, but an understanding isn't necessarily. So I would agree. It's so important that we find ways as a community to pass around, the pa pass along the accurate history of what really happened. I'll share an anecdote at uh, Bagley's uh, Transgender Youth Summit that we have every year, and we, we held earlier this spring uh, at, at Simmons. Uh, and uh, 200 young people and 100 parents were there, our largest one ever. and. Two or three 14, 15-year-olds sort of grabbed me in the hallway because I, I got used to over the years that, oh, 
young people don't want to hear stories of the old, old days, so I sort of stopped sharing that how many years ago. And they sort of grabbed me and they started peppering me with questions. And when they kind of figured out how old I was, that I actually remember before Stonewall that I was a genderqueer child, not using that language, in the 60s, they, they were fascinated and they wanted to know. And that was a reminder for me how important it is for us to have to build opportunities for that kind of sharing of information. I've, uh, quick, quick comment. So I also I think that um, as young people come from a different perspective, they're also going to identify where there's injustice mm -hmm. still, and that's what we see a lot of now. Um, and so, you know, we complain about people not remembering their history, but if you look at sort of Black Lives Matter, young people now, once they start to identify what an issue is, they learn history fairly quickly, um, and they are continuously because they expect better, they're identifying where things are not equal. And, um, and they do a pretty brilliant job of linking that to what has happened in the past. I, I see. I've got two quick points. Um, I, I agree that we didn't have the term intersectionality uh, 30 years ago, but it was always the elephant in the room when you read the poetry of Essek Hamphill, Marlon Riggs, black, gay, man, of a certain class, a certain color. Uh, it was always a tension there. Uh, and the second point that I want to make is one that I want to piggyback on uh, Stuart's point about the 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 movement, if you will, help to expedite the research and development of drugs and brought them to market. Along with that, um, condoms. You see condoms on television. The stigma associated with condoms has fallen away largely. So I think that's a very positive gain as a result of uh, the LGBT movement. Mm. I agree. Hi, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your stories and everything with us. Um, I am a medical student and I do not go to Harvard. Um, and so the, some of us are trying to push for more education about LGBTQ health. And um, it's really exciting to be with classmates who care a lot about this, but I think that we have uh, a lot of work in that we're trying to educate our peers um, and we're also trying to educate the um, administration and the people who have the power to institutionalize this, um, but for whatever reason don't quite see the value in that yet. Um, and so I was wondering if you had any um, advice on how to um, work within institutions and um, how to uh, basically get people with power like on your side. It's very interesting. I've been doing some some work as a um, the so-called scholarly stakeholder at uh, doing some work at the Brigham, um, and it, it, you talk about an, an institution that is an, well, it's an interesting institution. Um, but what's what's fascinating is it's been driven by and and the focus has been how to be more inclusive of LGBTQ individuals in the hospital setting, what should care look like, and particularly with the focus on trans patients, of how to be more um, welcoming, responsive, skill-based, et cetera. Um, so, and, and I was always fascinated by wh where did this come from? You know, what was the genesis of it? Uh, it has a lot to do with the people, a lot of the people who are employed there who also get their health care there. So it was as much about working with the employees, and that helped me to understand that most personal so if you get that place where people get to know people that things begin to happen in that way that benefit others um, it, it was looking at alliances so we spend a lot of time <clears throat> um, doing work at with partner health centers that are affiliated with the Brigham who are much easier to change than um, the system because they're embedded in the community and they're seeing things that might not uh, and the kind of patients that might not be at the Brigham uh, but are going to Southern Jamaica Plain Health Center um, and looking for help. And so bringing that voice into the work that we're doing and then feeding back uh, resources and information. 
Um, it was also very important, any of this work is very important, and particularly around inclusivity, about getting the, at the top to drive this. So it was very important to get the chief of staff and others to help drive and help implement the vision um, for this. Without that, it, it's just really, I find it, it can be done, but it's harder to do it from this way up. You really need it to meet. So you need to have the interest from people here, and you need to have the interest and authority from someone here, and it meets in the middle. Um, for medical students, for students in general, students have a lot more power than they realize to influence systems. Um, as, a, as an educator in higher ed, um, yes, you are students today, but you're potential donors tomorrow. We need a relationship with you. We're, it's very rare that we write you off. Your voices, your voices matter, if, and particularly when they come in a constructive way to say this can be better. Um, it, I'm watching, I'm amazed now to watch the number of hospitals, the Brigham, uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, uh, you know, go through all these hospitals, who five years ago wouldn't have talked about unconscious bias. It would never have been on their radar. They were denying that there was anything happening. Um, I can't tell you how many calls I'm getting now to help us figure out we have a problem and what do we do with it. Um, because client patients are complaining, people are complaining about their colleagues, and they want to address this issue. And I think the same is going to be true for the queer practitioners in healthcare settings. And so to organize uh, in a way that will help to, um, to give support and identify what the issues are that are patient-centered. That's my advice. I just want to add a couple of things. I know I'm the moderator. I'm not really a panelist, but I'm just going to barge in. Um, so one thing I would do is uh, we're actually publishing some issue briefs in the next couple of weeks that Tim and I have developed with some colleagues at the University of Chicago. We interviewed uh, people at hospitals and other healthcare facilities around the country who are promoting uh, sexual orientation, gender identity data collection in healthcare settings and making the case for that. And we talked to them about some of the obstacles that they encounter, such as people saying, well, is it really medically relevant, and that kind of thing. Uh, and one of the things we recommend is like to find a champion, um, to find an institutional champion, somebody who might be LGBT themselves, who might just be, who might just get it, and, and work with them to kind of build out from that. Um, another thing you could do is, um, Talk about all the important institutions that have come out in support of greater attention to LGBT health in medical school and other health professional curricula, like the commission that um, Jenny was on. It's the Association of American Medical Colleges. In 2014, they have this curricular guide that makes very concrete recommendations for how to do this. Uh, the Femway Guide to LGBT Health is published by the American College of Physicians. We have two editions going back to 2008. Uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which fund healthcare for, I think, like 80 million Americans, um, they have recommended much greater attention to LGBT health and collection of uh, sexual orientation, gender identity data, going back to their 2015 um, CMS equity plan for Medicare beneficiaries. You've got the Institute of Medicine report from 2011, another government agency that's recommending greater attention to LGBT health. Uh, the uh, Joint Commission, which accredits hospitals and nursing homes and other facilities, uh, in 2011 put out a, a guide to improving care for LGBT patients. Um, so there's lots of bodies, the AMA, you know, all these professional associations that are supportive. So if you can get all that, get the attention of somebody and say, look, this is happening in, you know, all these elite sort of um, well-respected governmental bodies and professional associations are saying, do more for LGBT health. So it's not just a student saying sure. it, you know? Can I just add a couple of yeah. things? So um, first of all, I just think the LGBT movement broadly has shown how different movements can be so, and based on the situation of the, of the population. So the LGBT health LGBT you know, movement for rights looks very different from the civil rights movement. It doesn't have well-known, charismatic national leaders. You know, it, because maybe we're sprinkled throughout all segments of the population, the coming out as an act of revolution, the outing that HIV did for both people with the, <clears throat> the disease but also for their caregivers, 
Um, you know, it's really amazing what was accomplished through this kind of very sort of quiet, silent happening in millions of places, softball leagues and just everything. But I think what we kind of still want to make sure is that we are creating communities. And I do think there's been so much change with online access. And, you know, you could complain about the bars being the only place to go when we were young. But now people say to me, no where's bar. the community? Where's right. the community? Right. I don't know how to find community. Yep. And that's where a lot of, you know, we need a wellness model and some of the health movements we've done. And Eric Rofe has led gay men's health summits that began AGP. T health summits and, and people built relationships across gender and race and lines and you know I I, I just think that that's the real key uh, and then I just keep going back to data too because if you don't know whether you're serving LGBTQ people and how many and, and what's going on for them how could you do anything so and, and I will put in a plug for two studies organized by the Ford Foundation. I think the first one was, I'm not sure who funded the second one, through the Williams Institute, which is based at UCLA. One was called the SMART study. It's Sean and I worked, worked on that to look at the best measures for collecting data on sexual orientation. And the other was called the Genius. They had a one up us for transgender health uh, um, questions. You know, that's that's been that's a been important resource because you had to demonstrate that these questions were validated and wouldn't destroy your survey and would get reasonably accurate results and so there's a, a science of course to that. Did, did that any of this answer or respond to the question that you asked from any of us? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to just start a campaign. There are people who are with you on this, and I just can't believe that you couldn't. Shame them into the public. I, I'm not in that school, so. But there must be ways to. I mean, there is the. I mean, but it's, are, they, it, are they objecting to this, or is it something that's just not? Yes. And then we have, I think, two, yeah. at least two more questions. It's not that there's like outright objection, it's more that they feel like the model that they have is good enough, and that there's like you know, they're at least introducing the topic maybe in one lecture. Um, and we just want more and don't think that it's enough. And also it's frustrating to um, have students do all of the work. Mm. And um, sometimes it feels like they're just kind of waiting us out. So if something's too hard to do or to implement, then they'll just wait until we start third year and aren't around as much. Um, I don't mean to badmouth my institution. I really like being there, but um, yeah, it's hard to, I guess it would be great to find a champion and to have someone whose role it is to um, make sure that this movement keeps happening even when there's student turnover. And I think that's where one of the sticking points is. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Andy Tan from Dana-Farber and the Harvard School of Public Health. And I guess my question to the panel is, you know, do you have any advice for scientists, social behavioral scientists who are willing to be part of the fight and would like to contribute to advocacy? How do we negotiate or navigate that those two different spaces of being you know, out there producing good science, but also using the science for advocacy? You know, I belong to the Society for Research in Nicotine and Tobacco and the APHA, where there are LGBT and health disparity caucuses, where I contribute you know, in terms of my membership, but I would like to learn um, from your insights about how to do more. It's an interesting tension that exists in, in the in the research world at times and in the advocacy world and in some scientific communities about how to join the two, except I would offer that there's some amazing models about the ways in which that has, has been done. And some of that has been around certain um, uh, attempts to eradicate uh, certain diseases. Uh, you know, uh, if we think about um, uh, 
it may not be the best example now, but the way in which we were able to work together, both in terms of what was good for the community and going out and advocating with the community to take certain vaccines early on. Um, we, we got very close to eradicating smallpox, or um, I remember as a kid lining up. It, there was a whole campaign that went around to line up and get a sugar cube with something on it. I forgot now what the medication, polio. polio because people were afraid of polio. We, everybody wanted something. The scientists wanted something. We, and they, and they, but you had to work to get people to trust this thing to go en masse to get their sugar cube. Um, and, but it, it worked. So science met community need, met um, uh, the ability to advocate for something. Um, so it can work the same way within AIDS, AIDS HIV of helping people to understand what the risk factors were for the disease, so doing education of the public, getting information out there, not blaming or shaming, but educating, uh, helping to get the scientific data, um, to get science on board, um, but we were partnering together. Um, the, the advocates, as an advocate, I need data, and that very often can come from science. Uh, science needs advocates, and that we can work together to, to change systems. But if we believe that we don't need one another and there's, that there are times when that can happen, then we lose the opportunity. Um, and there are scientific pieces of uh, their advocacy arms of most of the organizations, I would think, um, that you're probably involved with that are doing, that are progressives that want to make these kinds of changes happen. So um, that's my thought. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. So just a couple of quick things. One is that uh, when they were trying in the 90s to create treatment vaccines for HIV, I had the opportunity to work with the Salk Institute and Jonas Salk, met, meet Jonas Salk before, while he was still alive. And he said, and other, I'm sure other people said this too, he said in terms of his work, there were always three stages. There was the, it can't be done, Two was, you can't do it. And three was, we knew it all along. And so, uh, so there's always an aspect of transformation that is not just the evidence. It's, it's the uh, convincing and the making of the case. And I've, I've, I come out of city planning and law, so I didn't really study public health per se and just fell into it as a career. But the... Um, when I started to read some of the books about health and public health movements, they're incredible. One is not well known called Patenting the Sun about polio. It was a dissertation turned into the book. Amazing story. The most more recent one is uh, the Autobiography of Cancer by Siddhartha Mukherjee. What happens on the ground and what motivates people and what moves these things along is so much more than a scientist doing a study. On the other hand, scientists try train very long and hard to do those studies, and they're important. So, so you know, you have to figure out, do you also have a knack for some advocacy? Everyone should have a little sense of how do you share information. Sometimes in the LGBT health disparities world, we worry, are we just creating a sense that these are really unhealthy communities? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and we have to talk about uh, the abilities and the assets and the resilience as well. Mm -hmm. So few things to be thinking about. Yeah. I, I would just say two things you could be helpful with. One is um, data collection. The Trump administration it has rolled back. We now have um, about 18 federal surveys that collect sexual orientation data or same-sex couple household data. Uh, and then we have maybe seven or eight that collect transgender status data, gender identity. It's basically trans status. Um, are you transgender? Yes, no. And the Trump administration is trying to roll that back. And they, they, there was a question, questions were going to be added to a disability survey. They stopped that. Um, they removed a question that, that was on an aging survey, uh, Older Americans Act survey. Um, they're removing questions that are on a uh, criminal justice survey that allow 16 and 17-year-olds to self-identify as LGBT, which could give us information about um, intimate partner violence uh, and uh, involvement in the juvenile justice system for LGBT youth. Um, and then there's collection in clinical settings. Uh, you, 
data that we collect and use in electronic health records, and there's also a lot happening with that, and that could, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity could just be left behind as, they, as um, that sort of whole regulatory universe changes. Um, so that's one way that you could weigh in as a member of APHA or get APHA to weigh in and say, this is important. For us to understand public health issues, we need SOGI data. We need sexual orientation and gender identity data. And then the other thing you could do is talk about discrimination and how anti-LGBT discrimination um, hurts LGBT people and uh, affects their physical and mental health. There's data that, that show that. And the Trump administration, the day before Memorial Day weekend, proposed to repeal about a half a dozen uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, non-discrimination provisions that govern health care. So um, including like um, the PACE program, this, this um, elder services program. So it's health care, elder services, um, the insurance exchanges, uh, qualified health plans, tons of stuff. They're trying to roll back SOGI non-discrimination uh, provisions. So it would be great if the professional association, if Harvard School of Public Health could just sort of speak out and weigh in and say, this is really of concern to us. We wish you wouldn't do this. Um, yeah, the person in the third row there with the um, lanyard, the orange lanyard. Um, hi there. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. So my, my question kind of dovetails off that as a very young researcher. Uh, I have this concern that building a career on or wanting to dedicate myself to LG, LGBT health disparities ends up pigeonholing yourself. Uh, and kind of something that you had said, it, 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 that, that research ends up speaking to a vacuum of people who are in this room who you're speaking to right now. Um, and so the reverse of that professionally is that the people who want to show up and listen to your work don't see you as a good researcher, a broad researcher, they see you as like a disparities researcher, a minority health um, researcher in that sense. And I wonder if you could speak to that. And the other half of that is for, for individuals who have built a career off of research and advocacy, what feeds your resilience? How, how do you keep going after so many years that it's really, really, I work on adolescent suicide every day, all day. I sit down and read about it for eight hours a day, and it's really, really hard. Any sense of resilience or, or hope or what drives you there? So two questions. Thank you. I think this is more Stuart, but my first reaction is when, when an industry minimizes um, areas of research that affect disadvantaged or um, oppressed parts of the community and makes that less than so that uh, research that focuses perhaps on certain on women perhaps um, minority health as being less than research if i heard that correctly um, that that in and of itself is a problem that that becomes the bias within the system that it so it, it's not it doesn't surprise me then that research based on LGBTQ health would be seen as less than because it's part of the whole bias array. And so it's the bias that needs to be confronted um, in the system. And you know, the, I'm continuously perplexed by the, the statement sometimes that there, racism doesn't exist in science. Science is about data. <laughs> Um, well, the people doing gathering that data are people, so therefore bias exists. And, and but you, you get into these kinds of, of discussions sometimes with that, and until we can have that kind of discussion and elevate all data collection, particularly when it's about correcting health disparities and health issues, and seeing the, the people who are going to be benefit from that as being equal. Um, that then will do away with the stigma. But until we begin to look at the subjects as being of importance, then the research will always follow how we look at the subject. Oh, yeah. Well, you just did. You know, but again, it's experiments. It's, it's looking at things like Tuskegee, your heart study. You know, it, it, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's a great study of a certain segment of population. It, it you know, we, we don't have the kind of data that we need from that study about women because women weren't included, yet that drove everything we talked about about heart disease because women's lives weren't, some could say sexism uh, influenced 
poor outcomes for women and better outcomes for men, that that then becomes the way in which we look at everything. And, and that's, I have a problem with that. that. That's a problem. And that needs to be corrected. Because that sits in another, that's intersectionality. That sits in a whole other bubble. Um, and so sometimes we're going out to correct something that won't change the system. It'll fix a symptom. This is a symptom. Um, just a couple of thoughts. One is that I think, you know, Gary's point is really well taken that it's not, you know, it's, it's something that you, we have to look at more broadly and, and more creatively because you're, you and others like you are health services or health researchers, public health research service and systems thinkers. And the fact that you're maybe looking more at LGBTQ should not, in theory, right, affect that. But I, I, one thing that I've done, learned is that uh, you can sort of talk about disparities, but the, the, it doesn't really matter because I think at one point this was titled the kind of healthcare is a right. Mm. And um, everyone has a right to be treated appropriately and seen for who they are. So I used to give a talk on LGBT health disparities and how, you know, if LGBT people were smoking more than the mainstream, you had to address LGBT health disparities on tobacco in order to improve the general because that was a piece of the, of the problem that you were seeing that maybe you weren't addressing. But it didn't really matter if there's a disparity or not. LGBT people should get tailored information about smoking cessation regardless of whether they're smoking more or less than the population. Every population needs that and needs to be seen as having a right to that information uh, and so there's an obligation then to have the data that we need to understand it. And, and you know, I'm fortunate to be the second editor at the American Journal of Public Health for LGBT Health. The first was Michael Gross, who created the position. And I was lucky enough when he left that role to be nominated to do it and to get a chance. But at first, the papers were all disparity papers. It was because the first data we had. Then we started to look at the role of policy and the studies that were alluded to before. How do the state policies on everything from marriage to, to discrimination, you know, affect people's health? You know, now we're sort of entering into a kind of new era where people are doing all kinds of creative things with using spatial analyses and, and looking at intersectionality to really mm -hmm. dig deeper and, and learn more. And, and that's, that's what we have to do. Great. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry. We're going to have to end it here because we're past 8 o'clock and we, we had a hard stop at 8. But um, thank you all for coming, and we're going to take a quick picture, and then we can have other conversations if you have more questions, okay? Thank you. Thank you to the panelists.